Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Therapy. It's me by myself again. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to work this way. I will tell you this. Uh, right now, it's spring ball is still going on, and there are a lot of guys that I would like to have for interviews that aren't available yet because uh, we'll start picking them up in May. Next week, Mitch Sherman from The Athletic will join me to talk about, uh, well, Nebraska spring football. And tonight I thought I'd try something different. Now, you know, you know, well, maybe you don't know that I've started a different channel on YouTube called Hardcore College Football History. And it is about college football history. And it's more, here's the thing with it. If you go out on YouTube or you go looking for content, when you look at sports history, a lot of what you see is just, Oh, here are the greatest games ever. These are the greatest athletes ever. Uh, you know, the greatest coaches. This was this freak play that happened. But there's not really anything about history. You know, how the game was built, how the game changed, how the game became, you know, and I guess I've always been kind of a history person. I know that a lot of people don't care for history at all. Uh, I remember... <laughs> This is not a history thing, but I remember a few years ago, a guy sent me an email and he told me that he'd only read one book since he'd left high school. And that was my the book I wrote about, um, you know, my memoir about me dying from the heart attack and recovering. Been dead, never been to Europe, available on Amazon. Huh. Minnie says, uh, everybody having a corntastic day. You know, it's uh, tax day. And uh, that hurt a lot this year. And that's really, I should just keep going now because that's depressing. I don't know how yours went, but <laughs> mine is like being punched in the face every year. Probably because I'm a poor planner. Okay, last week, last week at this time, uh, we didn't have a show. And that's because there was a national title game. And a little bit before that was, uh, let's see if I can find it. Iowa lost in the national title game against South Carolina. South Carolina's undefeated season. And I am trying to put find where I put my and I tweeted this on April 7th at 4:09 p.m. when it was clear that Iowa was going to get smoked. This is what I tweeted on Twitter. And uh it, you know, of course I was trolling the Iowa fans. I mean, my God, why else be on social media if you can't troll people? But what happened is this you got some people responded, obviously, and um, a lot of Nebraska fans responded and were like, ah, ah, ah uh, where's all the trophies in their trophy case? And one person responded to it and said, you know, where's Na Nebraska's national titles? Iowa has more national titles than Nebraska. And I think they do. They have 24 national titles in wrestling. And I think that's the only sport they've won a national title in. But... What happened on this tweet is some guy responded and he says, well, Nebraska, Iowa has five national titles in football. And I, it triggered me. It was a, it's a, it was a troll against the troll. And what I, Iowa doesn't have five national titles in football, for God's sakes. Listen, Iowa claims the 1921 national title. The 1921 national title, as recognized by the NCAA, went to Cornell. And if you go over to the Hardcore College Football History Channel, uh, I just did a video about a man named Gil Doby who won Cornell's national titles in 1921, 1922, and 1923. And he literally had, uh, I don't know, he didn't lose a game for his first 11 years of coaching. He didn't get beat I, he, the guy was an incredible coach that nobody's ever heard of. And that's the kind of history I'm talking about. So, you know, that's, uh, hopefully we'll see what the response on is on this, but it triggered me. And the other thing that triggered me is somebody tweeted out how, uh, you know, oh, here's a list of all the national title winners and the people that claim national titles. Well, Alabama claims 18 national titles. Michigan claims 11 Nebraska, 11 national titles. Uh, as I said, Iowa claims five. Nebraska has five national titles. And I think the thing is, is uh, they could claim more. I mean, if, if come on, listen. 
the AP poll, which, you know, we've always, for years, we talked about how the national title in football was a mythical national title because there was no playoff like there is in the NFL. There's no real determination. It's all like, a you know, the polls determined who the national title winners were for years. Uh, the AP poll didn't start until 1936. And if you think about it, there were decades of football before that, before there was ever a poll. Uh, people in the East, where football started, just decided they'd choose who won the national title every year. That's why you get Cornell winning a lot of national titles or Yale, Harvard, and Princeton and Penn winning all the national titles early on. <sighs> I know I got to learn how to slow down again. But I was triggered. And I, I just, you know, because if you go out and look at the NCAA, uh, the NCAA does not show Alabama with 18 national titles. They do not show Michigan with 18 national or 11 national titles. So for me, I look back and I thought uh, 1915 would be one of the years. If, if you go to the Wikipedia page, you will find that uh, through certain, you know, mathematical things that the Wikipedia page will say that, um, Nebraska has five unclaimed national titles. I don't think we have that many that are really actually legitimate. Um, I do think that, you know, 1902, we were coached by Bummy Booth. Uh, that was a season I think we went undefeated and not I don't think we went unscored upon, but I did a video about that. 1915. Here's what's going on in 1915 in football. If you want to hear the history about it. Uh, what's happening is this. Football starts in 1869. And all the way up until 1910, it's largely contained in the west, in the northeast part of the country. Yale, Harvard, Princeton, and Penn are the big four teams that are considered the best teams in college football. And as it spreads across the nation, teams start playing it all over the place. But they're not playing against the same, you know, they're not playing against mostly against the same level of teams. Uh, for example, well, let me step back a second. Football starts in the Northeast. You know, it starts between Princeton and Rutgers. Yale and Harvard get involved. Princeton gets involved. Walter Camp, the father of American football, uh, has heavily controls the rules committee. And, and there are certain other people on the rules committee that form the foundation of college football. And if you're not in the East, the Northeast, your team doesn't get recognized until they start beating teams that really are recognized that by that power structure. It's kind of like if you look at football right now, where is the power structure in football? You know, it's really in the Big Ten and the SEC. And up until last year when Michigan won the title, it was heavily controlled by the SEC because you got Alabama and Georgia winning all the national titles, right? So back then, with no conferences really, uh, the big, uh, let's see, the Western Conference gets formed around, I think, 1895 or, or 1899, somewhere in there. That's the forerunner to the Big Ten. But here's what's happening. You've got Dr. Williams is a coach at Minnesota, and he's involved on the, on the, uh, rules committee. So those people in the East start recognizing that he's a good coach and they start recognizing Mer Minnesota early in the process saying, well, we're going to look at Minnesota and consider them a good team. The University of Chicago, which ended football, I think it's 1948, uh, was coached by Amos Alonzo Stagg. He was a part of the rules committee. University of Chicago kicked everybody's ass then. They were considered a good team by the Northeast. And Charles Hudlick comes in with the comment, so you're saying media bias played a part in early football recognition. Yes, it did. It played a very heavy part in it. And I think the problem that I have, or maybe that's, well, it is a problem. I'll admit that. I think this, you know, I am kind of a history guy. I think history is important. We have this sport that we love and we don't know it's history worth a damn because it's really not covered very well by anybody. I think for Nebraska fans, 
you know, we look at history of Nebraska football and we go, well, football, the Nebraska football history didn't start until Bob Devaney. Well, that's not true. Nebraska has a very, very rich football history that's very er early on. And that's kind of hoping what I, what I'm, that's some of that stuff is what I'm hoping to cover with the hardcore college football history channel. <laughs> so, in the East, right, in order to get recognized, you have to start playing against and you have to start beating the teams that are known quantities. In other words, you have to play a Harvard. You have to play a Yale. So I think for Nebraska fans, and I've seen it already mentioned in the comments, what we know about early Nebraska history is this. We know we played Notre Dame and beat them. We know in the 1920s that Nebraska was the only team to beat the four horsemen from Notre Dame. And that's pretty famous. So in the 1920s, you know, Nebraska, Notre Dame, Nebraska, Notre Dame actually started playing, I think in 1912, somewhere in there, but they played for a series. You know, they played a number of years and it was a fairly even series, but Nebraska was the only team to beat the, ho the four horsemen. They beat them twice. That's a whole different story. I could go into that tangent and it's very interesting. Um, Involves the Ku Klux Klan, and that will be a video I make later on. But um, anyway, back to 1915. Here's what's going on with Nebraska in 1915. And this is all because this guy triggered me about the, in Iowa having five national titles. So Nebraska in 1915 is coached by a guy named Ewald Steen. And here, Ewald Steam played at Wisconsin. Wisconsin was starting to get recognized more and more by the Eastern powers because they're in the Big Nine Conference, a conference that obviously is going to be the Big Ten, but doesn't allow Nebraska to join the Big Nine because I think academic reasons, something. There's a reason they can't. That's part of, not, that's part of another story. But Ewald Steen comes into Nebraska, and he coaches in Nebraska from 1911 to 1915. And in 1950, he over those five years, he goes 35, two and three, with a 913 winning percentage. He is the he is the most winning coach Nebraska has ever had in their school history. And. Uh, he comes into the, by the end, I'll tell you this. By the end of his reign, he was on a 34 game winning streak at Nebraska, but he left Nebraska to go to Indiana. Okay. Nebraska in the 1915 season is undefeated. They're eight and oh, they playing in the Missouri Valley conference. And the problem with that is, is that the Eastern people who are in charge of everything pretty much, but think about ESPN and their Eastern bias sometimes, you know, or what you, you know, that now it's an SEC bias because they make a lot of money from the SEC. But the Missouri Valley Conference isn't really recognized like the big, you know, the big nine conference is as being a power conference or, you know, it'd be more like the Sun Belt these days to people in the East Coast or up, you know, who are doing all the, we're going to pick national title people and all this and give you recognition. But Nebraska in 1915, I got to slow down so this lasts longer. <laughs> this is the thing about doing these alone. I got to learn how to pace myself better. I keep saying that, but I'm not doing that great a job at it. Okay. Nebraska beats Kansas State, Iowa State, and Kansas that year. Uh, they don't play Minnesota. And that was a big thing because beating Minnesota early on, if you start beating Minnesota, uh, you start getting the recognition. The people in the East start recognizing you. Hey, they beat Minnesota. Minnesota is good. Therefore, Nebraska is starting to get good. And that's what happened in 1902, which is why the 1902 Nebraska team is a special team. Uh, but what they did is they beat Notre Dame. Okay. So right here. Oops. Right here. Huskers win from Notre Dame. 20 to 19 guy Chamberlain, who was a big, big, you know, he was, he was a huge part of the, the uh, 1915 team. And he was their, their best player. And 
he is a story all by himself. But Nebraska beats Notre Dame. So what does that mean? That means that the Eastern people are, that Notre Dame's like one step ahead of Nebraska in 1915. Because Notre Dame in 1915 is coached by Newt Rockney. In 1913, they had gone east and they beat Army in probably what I would consider the most important game in college football history. And the reason for that is it's the game where everybody starts to recognize that the forward pass isn't just a gimmick, but that it can be used as part of an offense to you know, be really dynamic and explosive. I have a video about that on the Hardcore History channel too. But... Nebraska beats Notre Dame two years after they beat Army. And at this point, Notre Dame is going around the country. And they're, and the reason why Notre Dame is going around the country is because of their Catholicism. Because the schools, most teams, like if you remember I said Nebraska beat Kansas, Iowa State, and Kansas, or Kansas State, Iowa State, and Kansas, they'd play Doan. They'd play, you know, teams that were close by them because, you know, in 1915, you're not getting on a plane to go anywhere. You're getting on a train. It's going to take you days to get from here to there. So you play people that are close to you. And, you know, you 1915 around then, people are starting to set up conferences like the Missouri Valley Conference. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought there. The Notre Dame is going all over the place, and they're starting to play everybody all over the place. The schools local that are close to them won't play them because they're a Catholic school. So they're forced to go out and play other big schools. And the Big Nine early on tells Notre Dame, basically, you cannot join us. You're not good enough. Go out and earn a reputation. And that's what Notre Dame does. And uh, am I pronouncing it right? Because I did a Notre Dame, I did a Notre Dame video. Boy, I got a lot of shit from those people for pronouncing it Notre Dame, Notre Dame, Notre Dame. <laughs> anyway, so Nebraska beats Notre Dame, Notre Dame. I got to get this start getting this right, or do a better job at that. 1915, right? At the end of 1915, here's what happens. Nebraska is undefeated. Nebraska is actually invited to what would become the Rose Bowl. In 1915, in the 1916 Rose Bowl, quote, unquote. You probably think, why does he know all this stuff? God, does he have friends? No, I don't. Todd's gone. The hell with everybody. Anyway. 1916 Rose Bowl was called the East-West Tournament game, and they weren't playing it. They played one Rose Bowl or one East-West Tournament game in 1902. Michigan played Stanford. They beat them 49 to nothing, and they beat them so bad that the game, literally the Stanford captain comes and says, eight minutes left in the game, and he says, we're too exhausted to carry on. And it's a disaster for the Tournament of Roses people. So they refused to have football for another, what is it, 14 years, 15 years, until the 1916 Rose Bowl. Nebraska is invited because they're undefeated, and this is the East-West tournament game, and they want a team from, you know, from them to the East. So guess what happens? Because being in the Tournament of Roses game, you know, the Rose Bowl, would have been a huge, huge made a huge impact on Nebraska's notoriety, a huge impact on Nebraska's recognition. And what happens? Nebraska, the people in charge of Nebraska, whatever the board of regents or whoever it is, says, no, we can't go because it is going to cost too much money. <laughs> so if you want to be pissed off about the board of regents, for over a hundred years ago, there you go. You can be pissed off, and you can even be more pissed off at the fact that here's what happens with Ewald Steen. At the end of the year, he's angry that he didn't get to take his team to the Rose Bowl because he knows that it would have provided Nebraska with way more recognition, and he wants to be recognized 
as a as a good coach, as a nationally known coach. And there are coaches, there are schools all over the place that want him to come coach for their school. <sighs> okay, I'll slow down again. He he asked for a seven hundred and fifty dollar raise. Now a seven hundred and fifty dollar raise doesn't sound like much, and it, you know, but it's probably a lot in those days. And guess who? Guess what happens? They of course turn him down because they, they don't want to pay him that much. So he takes a $250 raise and he goes to Indiana. If you want to be even more angry at the people that were running in Nebraska over a hundred years ago. So that's what happened. You, you take a guy that's on a 34 game winning streak. He has a 913 winning percentage. And because you won't pay him $750 more a year, he says, screw this stuff and leaves Nebraska and goes to Indiana. And he doesn't have nearly the amount of success at Indiana because, I mean, come on. This freaking Indiana, for God's sakes. How many winning coaches have they had in winning at Indiana? I don't know the answer to that. But you know, you know what I mean? He goes like 20 and 18 over so many years. And he does, he tragically does pass away of, of can cancer. Uh, at like age 47 or something like that. I'm still doing the research on this to turn it into a video. And I'm not done yet. And we're gonna, I'm going to slow down a bit and, uh, and uh, catch my breath. And then we'll look at some comments because they just have, you guys have been doing a good job of, uh, you know, uh, there you go. What about a Bain Close says, what about a metric that is easier to measure, such as conference championships? Well, the thing you're talking about now or then, because now, then they're, you know, what about, let's see, probably about 1910 is when they really kind of start forming conference championships. The other thing you have to consider is this the entire West Coast there aren't very many teams really playing football. You're, you've got like Washington playing football, but Washington in 1950, let's say 1910, Washington, for example, is playing, they're playing like maybe Oregon state and they might be playing uh, Washington state, but mostly their schedule consists of them playing like high schools or very small colleges. And this is the problem with determining a national title in those days is, number one, things are extremely regional. And number two, most of the schools that we know today, they were playing much smaller schools and they would play exhibition games against high schools. And they, of course, would have everybody would be undefeated, you know, and that's the problem with 1915. And we'll get to that to a minute. I'll, uh, I'll, t I'll look for some more comments here. Uh, uh, did I see that I do this one already? Charles Hollett says Harvey Perlman is who I blame for Nebraska not playing in the 1960 Rose Bowl. It works. Justin Roggy says, John, you are who we've needed to teach us. As the saying goes, history forgotten is sure to be repeated. Well, the thing is, is I think if you can look at our, our college football history, again, this is the game we love. I, we're Nebraskans mostly, for God's sakes. We all love college football. And I think if you look back, the, I had another choice for this show, and I decided not to do that one. And, and that subject is... Um, why do we think everybody? Why do we think college football players should be amateurs? And I want you to think about that. And if you have any responses to that, if you resent the fact that nil has come along and college football players and student athletes are going to get paid, I'd really like to know why you have an objection to that. Uh, Charles Hollett says Bobby Knight is the only Indiana coach I can remember. Well, Lee Corso coached at Indiana years ago, and you know we beat the shit out of him when we played him. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Living in Omaha, David Matney says, imagine if back then someone would have said in the future, we are going to pay $15 million to make an unsuccessful coach go away. I imagine they would have freaked out a lot. Uh, Brad Wilson says, John, good to catch you as it has been a while. Great topic. Thank you for being here, Brad, being here, Brad. And, uh, you know, thanks for the comment. 
GBR Far North, will there be an episode on Dana X Bible? I don't know. You know, that's the thing is I wanted to see how this people would respond to this because there are a lot of choices for Husker content. And I think that uh, I'm probably the only one that's going to cover history because I don't think, uh, well, I honest, I don't mean to be rude to the rest of them, but I don't think people know a lot, history a lot, like really deep history. And uh, okay. Da, 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 da. Oh my God. Oh, that's true. James Boardman says, I remember when Osborne got a raise to $100,000 is in the early 90s and people in this state lost their minds. It, we did really do that. We all freaked out about all this stuff. Um, and, you know, and, and and that's, who was it? I'm not a Major League Baseball guy. The, the first guy that made a million dollars in Major League Baseball, and now people are being paid like half a billion dollars to play baseball this it what sports is insane uh the other the other subject i wanted to cover at some point is why sports is insane and why sports is so expensive i think that what's going on right now tonight is the wnba draft and caitlin clark is going to go first or maybe she already has i don't know uh but i, I guess you know there's this thing about how that's going to bring up the uh you know, the, the numbers for the WNBA. And I'll be curious to see what happens with that uh, because I, I don't watch the NBA and I don't, I'm not going to watch the WNBA. I, I just, I don't, I like college sports. And that was <clears throat> Blaine Cole says, I would be interested in a history of Nebraska's football rivalries. They have changed considerably and not for the better. Why do you say not for the better? It's because we're not playing for championships with Oklahoma. I mean, that's a pretty – that uh, that rivalry was one of the best in sports. And, you know, Michigan, Ohio State are still around. Georgia, Alabama is still around. But uh, losing that rivalry, uh, I think – yeah. It, it, you know, but it's been a while. It's not a rivalry anymore. We have a rivalry with Iowa and – God help us. Maybe we can establish a rivalry with like Oregon. Maybe something will happen on the field where we, I don't know, break their quarterback's legs or something. <laughs> and something horrible. Oh, whatever. <laughs> oh, my God. Husker Chuck says, whoop, wait a minute. I didn't hit the right one. Husker Chuck says, yes, Nebraska should claim 1915. They beat Notre Dame, who was an excellent team that season. Notre Dame beat Army and only lost to Nebraska. Well, that's the thing. Because here's the thing about the 1915 season. And I, like I said, I wasn't completely done doing research on this. Uh, I do, here's what I do when I do research. Well, I'll tell you the story. When for 20, I wrote in the computer industry for 20 years and about year 2000, when blogging started, all the magazines I wrote for went out of business in like a year and a half. So I quit writing for two, three years. And then the, the, I was so full of shit. It was building up inside me. It had to go somewhere. I started writing again. Uh, so I wouldn't just rant at my family and, you know, just like out of nowhere, just come up with rants about something. And it had it needed. I needed an outlet, so I started writing about Nebraska stuff. But SB Nation got a hold of me. They said, "Would you be our Nebraska guy?" And I said, "Yeah, I'll do that. Why not? The hell not! I don't have to run my own website." But what I did was I started reading all sorts of football books because I figured if you're going to cover college football, you should know the history, and you should know as much about college football as possible. Now, years later, you know that I've been writing about sports for almost 20 years now. Uh, I I don't think most sports writers take that tack. I don't think they read books that I don't think they read about the history of the sport that much. And I'm not trying to be rude from Trum. Their jobs don't require that they read about the history of the sport. But I the, our, the sport has amazing, fascinating characters. 
unfortunately, years ago, I took all my books or most of my books, the, not the Nebraska books, and I gave them away to my local library, and they no longer have them. Uh, because I'm guessing they're going, to, who the hell reads this much shit about college football? God, this guy must be mental. But uh, one, one of the most, I wanted to go back. You know, here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go back and start going back through college football history because, quite frankly, when I died, I lost a lot of that knowledge. So for starting the Hardcore History Channel thing is a lot of, me trying to recover a lot of that knowledge that I had about college football history. And so a lot of it is me kind of rediscovering what I already knew, which sounds really kind of bizarre, I realize, but you know, that's, that's how life goes sometimes. Uh, one of my favorite stories out of all those books was, yeah, well, there were a lot of them, but one of the stories I remember was about a Texas high school football coaches. And a Texas high school football coach, this has to be in the late 40s or 1950s, early 1950s, had his football team go to a swimming pool and he had poured oil across the top of the swimming pool and set it on fire. And he had his team swim from one end of the swimming pool to the other swimming, the other end of the swimming pool, underneath all of this burning fire that was on top of the water. And he told them, he says, you know, I wanted them to understand that they could do things that were unimaginable to them. And the reason where he got this idea was he was destroyer in World War II, was shot out from underneath him. And he came up to the surface amongst all this burning debris around him. And he lived and he thought, well, that's a good lesson. I'll, I'll teach my football team this lesson. And you kind of look at that and you go, that's insane. That is completely batshit insane. Can you imagine somebody even coming close to doing something like that now? But, you know, the, the books, the history books are full of those kinds of things. And they're amazing stories like that to be told. Okay, I'm going to bring Patrick uh, Gerhardt in here just because uh, I need somebody to help me breathe. Um, hello, Patrick. Good evening. How you're are gonna, you? You're going to wreak my night? Sorry. It's supposed to be a wreck. <laughs> okay. I'm going to just one more bit on this 1915 thing. Okay. Here's the problem with, Nash, with, with the national title in 1915. Undefeated teams in 1915 is Cornell, the one that the NCAA recognizes. Pittsburgh is 8 and 0. Washington State who actually wins the Rose Bowl over Brown because Nebraska turned down the invitation, they're 6 and 0. Washington is 7 and 0 and Oklahoma is 10 and 0. And Oklahoma is probably one of the weakest out of all of those because Oklahoma that for their season they played practically nobody. But they beat them all. Uh, Cornell had beaten good teams, and that's why they get recognized as a national title holder. But there's the problem with going back that far and just saying, we're going to claim this national title like Iowa did or Alabama did or Michigan did. Is You know, well, our teams were undefeated. Well, yeah, a ship, tons of people were undefeated. Now, do you want to join in on this 1915 thing? or? Yeah, you just – I just want to bring up the fact, if you haven't brought it up yet, that Ewald was not only a great football coach, but also a great basketball coach. He won conference titles as a basketball coach in Nebraska in that time, too, which to me makes him probably the greatest Nebraska coach we've ever had. <laughs> he could so do you're both. pissed. So you're you're pissed off that uh, they didn't give him a raise and keep him around. Yeah, he went to Indiana instead. Because Indiana was going to pay him. It wasn't fair. <laughs> uh, oh, son of a bitch. Is this true? What? Charles Hollett says, I heard that Greg Sharp announced that he has cancer, not a joke. Oh. That would be terrible. Yeah, very terrible. Huh. I, I tell you, I, I'll tell you what. I. Uh, well, I've I've been around Greg Sharp a few times. He's a really he's a really great guy. I wish I had his voice. Uh, I think that 
uh, him doing Husker baseball makes baseball easier to listen to on the, the radio or the Husker. I listen to it on the iPhone app. I, he's been around a long time. I hope, you know, I hope that it's not horribly serious, but uh, I guess we'll find out. Uh, we'll find out more as time goes on. Yeah, no, it's really sad to hear. Yeah, oh. it sucks. Okay. What, else what do got? you, what do you, what else you got for me? <laughs> You're supposed to show up and save me, not destroy my night. I was good. No, no, that was my goal to destroy your night. Yeah, no. See, folks who are playing at home, uh, when John gets real desperate for guests, that's when he comes calling for me. <laughs> so basically, nothing's going on right now. Everybody's got better things to do, and that's why you get me. <laughs> well, there, there's a num- There's like th- almost 400 people watching this, so that's great. Probably a handful that know that know who I am, which is going to make my life fun tomorrow. But no. Uh, what do you want to talk about? You have baseball on a lot lately. Well, I think I've, I've run through all of the things that I did about 1915. And at some point, you know what? I, I want to, I want to do a 1915 video before the spring game. And then, uh, there you go. Are we the other video? To- you're coming. Ahead. Down, aren't you? Yes. We have a gathering that's going to go on that was just released at uh, Coronation. We're going to Sunday. We will have like a tailgate. Uh, you know, I'll be down there for the Iowa series that we play in baseball that weekend. You're not going to go to the spring game. Yes. So you're going to do both. tickets. You, you yeah. Spring game and uh, there you go. How about how about softball? Anything on softball? Nobody has offered me tickets to that. Come on, Coronation listeners. Readers, hook this guy up. I don't think, I don't, you know, I don't know if I've been in, I don't know if I've been in Bowling Stadium, or at least I haven't for many, many years. So, uh, technically, what's that? 21, probably technically. When wasn't that when that was built? 21 years ago. Oh, I thought you meant 2021. I thought, wow, it's been around longer than that. (sighs) Okay. David Madden, he says, how long would have Scott Frost have lasted if he was not a Husker legend? Three years. Yeah, he would have lasted three years. I mean, that's what we gave Mike Riley. You know, and if you think about it, uh, Mike Riley was really just kind of a placeholder so he could figure something else out. Because That um, was the general vibe I got from the athletic department. Just kind of like he was a placeholder. At best, he might get to five or six years, retire. Nebraska finds another coach to try to replace Tom Osborne. <laughs> what are you okay. working on? Over there? What? What are you working on over there? I'm trying to figure out questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. No, I'm looking at the comments. Oh, there we this go. is the hard part about doing this by myself. Is there a lot of comments flowing by, and then they just. Uh, Minnie says, "Any thoughts on who could enter the transfer portal?" This is a good subject because the transfer portal opens tomorrow and Nebraska has a very large roster. And I'm sure that uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure that we're going to lose some players. I I can guess on who is not going to enter the transfer portal, Patrick. Who? No quarterbacks. (laughs) Even Heinrich. Well, I, it would be stupid for him to enter the transfer portal. I mean, my God, he's like, you know, a, two interceptions away from being a starter again. <laughs> that is true. I mean, you can't argue that one. That's that, that's right. You know, uh, there was a big article in the World Herald today regarding the offensive line and the depth there, um, especially with some of the guys who transferred in not hit crack in the first string yet. Um you know, I could see some linemen possibly if if the plane wasn't looking too good and you were an older guy, want to get some get some quarters in. I could see some transfers maybe come out of there tomorrow. What about uh, receivers? Receivers? I don't know any. We have receivers. We have really? a gob of receivers. I mean, we went out and got a shit ton of them. Oh, that's good. Oh yeah, uh, we got a guy from Wake Forest, didn't we? I think one of their top guys came to Nebraska. Right? Yes, we did. Yes. <laughs> Jamal Banks, I think it is. There I was you go. looking up the I was looking up the roster. 
I have I have articles. I have not I, history stuff all over my <laughs> monitors, but I have no current anything. Um, you know, running back room might be a little busy this this upcoming year. Probably running back. <laughs> but in terms of names, oh my I god! Have you know, we also have we have. Oh, these can't all be defensive backs. They are all defensive backs. We have an unbelievable shit ton of defensive backs. And they're not separated by cornerback or safety on the roster. They're just defensive backs. Okay. Maybe some of them entering the portal. Because we're, what, 20-some over? I don't think we're – I don't think we're as far over as people think we are. Okay. Because I think the whole nil thing is is blurred the lines of – of you know, do you need to be on a scholarship or do you not? Uh, yeah, a lot of those last those guys we got at the end of this last recruiting cycle, um, a lot of the articles said they were non scholarship players. So that tells me NIL's pay for it. All right. I, wait, did did people have any thoughts? See, I was, I'm not paying attention to the comments. Where's our producer? <laughs> He took the he took the off season off. Uh, the off season, okay. Yeah. All right. You know, I maybe we'll do that this coming year. We'll get get a producer. You want to produce? No. <laughs> uh, Remember, I technically quit four years ago. Did you? He seized up. So he <laughs> James Boardman says, I would expect a running back or maybe a cornerback or two. Profound statement. Uh, Blaine Cole says, what's with the Bob Guccione lens treatment for John's guest? He has a, he has a cheaper webcam than I do. Actually, I, I can probably fix this. I can fix this. Linda Wilkins says, John, did you read my joke? No, it was too long, for God's sakes. And it was dirty. And I, I there's so much stuff going on, for God's sakes. I'll come back and read it. Uh, Minnie says, whoops. My, uh, Minnie says, we have like something like 50 walk-ons. Huster Chuck says, should we right, call them right. cash on? I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> Okay, I'm guessing. Uh, let's see. I don't know. Wide receivers, you've got so many of them that there's so many of them. I mean, we have a still a very young team. Mm-hmm. Isaiah Nayor, who was a transfer in, and Jamal Banks are the only seniors. Well, Isaiah Garcia Castaneda is a senior. But I mean, everybody else is, you know, juniors, mostly redshirt freshmen and freshmen, sophomores. I don't know if I expect any of those people to transfer. I don't know. It's yeah. always a shock, isn't it? Not always. Um, who was the first one to the end of the transfer portal this last year? That tight end who ended up at a, I think he went to Northern Illinois, but he was like 18th on the death chart. Uh, Gargamel 91 says they are 15 over. Oh, I was five off. Hmm. Uh, that wait, there's Husker basketball news. We have some players coming in. Husker Chuck says, Congrats, congrats to Husker basketball for renting a 610 forward. What do you no, know about not. the basketball guy, basketball guys coming in? Um, well. A lot of guys went in the portal, but honestly, most of those guys in my mind who entered the portal from Nebraska probably weren't going to see any starting time anytime soon. I mean, that you know includes C.J. Walter, who's great six man, but he's not going to start on Nebraska anytime soon. Um, in terms of coming in, we just had a guy come in today. I wrote the article like three hours ago um, from Utah. Um, Raleigh Worcester, he's a yeah. – I think this is going to be his COVID year. Uh, Because he played one year, no, 
yeah, COVID year because he first year he was at Utah State. Uh, and then the previous next three years, he was at Utah where he jumped in the portal this past year. Uh, injured, I think he's a, you know, ankle, lower, lower leg area um, back in January and hasn't played since then. But he's, he scored almost 10 points a game. I think 5.5 rebounds, not too bad for a guard. Um, I think he, everything I read about him says he's, he's, he's a workhorse, which will bode, bode you well at Nebraska. Um, but he might be one of the one of the key pieces to next year's team for sure, especially with he's his a point experience. a point guard. Oh, he's a guard. Yeah, I don't know if I, he's a point per se, but he's a guard. So six foot four, plays defense. Yeah, plays defense. Plays defense very well, especially for a guard. So, but hopefully his whatever's wrong with his leg heals up and he's good by by the time summer comes around. Yeah, Husker Chuck says. Read the play-by-play -play account in the 1915 Nebraska Notre Dame game. Wish I could animate it. Well, here's the thing: I would love to be able to animate some of these games, and I'm trying to figure out how I could do that. I think with After Effects, which is a tool from Apple, but you have to have expertise to do that. Because one of the games I would like to animate for the History Channel is the 222 to nothing win in 1916 by Georgia Tech over Cumberland. Because it would be interesting just to see how in the hell they scored 220 points in a football game. And I know how they did this, but to see it happen would be, you know, plus there's games back in that area where each team would punt like 20 times. So that would be, I don't know, those would be interesting to watch. Or really boring very quickly. Oh, my God. You're supposed to, you're, you're supposed to, this is why I call you last. You're supposed to pump things up, buddy. Aaron Keene asks, what happened with football across the nation when America entered World War I? Full stop. Actually, here's what happened. And this is no, a subject of the No, it wasn't. Uh, here's what happened. And this is, again, another video I've been researching. There was something called... Oh, and it, it, the MTCA, I believe it was called, and I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but here's what happened. The military started uh, training at camps across the United States, and many of the universities ran those camps. And what they actually did was they took shitloads of young men that were being drafted into a service in World War I so America could build an army. And they started teaching them how to play football. So here's what happens here. Keep in mind, the people who went to college in 1915, they weren't this Joe down the block that could just get a loan and from, you know, and go to college. They were normally people that had money. So you have a whole group of working class, class people that never had the chance to go to college and therefore never got involved in college football. But when they go into the draft and they go into these service camps, they start learning how to play football because football at that time was an extremely violent, rough game. I mean, it still is, but, you know, let's face it. I mean, if you go back and look at the way they played football, it would kill most of the people that played today. It really would. But this was one way they saw of toughening up troops to get them ready for battle was to make them learn to play football because they have to get these young men conditioned to go over and, and fight in trench warfare, which is truly horrific. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole gob of universities that are involved with these programs, and I'll be doing a video. I have a whole crap load of ideas on history videos to do about this stuff. But what happens after World War II is this. College football and the NFL start in the 1920s. College football doesn't start, but the NFL starts in the 1920s, right? But college football popularity explodes in the 1920s. And the reason it explodes is because all of these young men were exposed to it, and they all come back, you know, and they start playing football, and they start going to college, and they, you know, and it's, World War I is a massive, massive influence on sports in America. There you go. Did you know that, Patrick? I had no clue about any of this, other than I think the heaviest player on the field was probably around 130 pounds. That's, 
if you were 200 pounds or you were a huge human being at that point. Hey, uh, you don't knock it. Um, sprint football might just save football. You mean you mean the UFL or whatever it is? No, sprint football. It's like seven on seven. It's played mainly oh, in the East Coast. Sprint football, yeah. You have to be you can't be any heavier than I think 170 pounds to play. That rules out a lot of Americans. Well, it could help. <laughs> Uh, speaking of the UFL, have you watched any of this new league? No, I have not whatsoever. Have you? I've watched a little bit of it. My son sat there next to me and made fun of Adrian Martinez. And all Adrian Martinez did was throw for like 338 yards or three over 300 yards and three touchdowns and a win. So, you know, he did that. How do you look? I'm just curious. I haven't seen him play in a few years. Well, when I was watching, he looked like crap, and my son was giving me shit about it. And I'm like, "What the hell? Why do you? Why do you? Why do you keep beating on me about everything? Why do you live here? Thank He's God you have a mother. He yeah, still lives with you? The youngest son, yeah. That's my. He's that got a be. job. We're allowing. He's paying off his student debt. That's what he's oh, supposed nice. to be doing. Nice. Um, let's see. Playing great question. Point guard and Nebraska even needs someone did that with the old electric football game. <laughs> John, when was David Manny says, John, when was the first college football game filmed? Uh, was that 1903? Nineteen, 1903. There's like a four minute film made by Thomas Edison of a game between, I think, Yale and Harvard in 1903. Uh, I've used that footage in some of my videos, but you can go out on YouTube and find it. Oh, Jazz Shelley did get uh, picked in the draft, the WNBA nice. draft. Uh, 29th pick. I don't know who she went to. I don't. Is that good? Is that a I first round so. pick? There, um, WNBA does three rounds, uh, 12 picks a round, I think, if, if that's right. So, second round, she is the first Husker to be drafted in 10 years. Do you know who the last one was? No idea who was it. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what happened last year. Yeah, I Kate only was... know what I only know what happened 100 years ago. Uh, Wait. Yeah, okay, okay, all right. So Jazz. Yeah, oh, third round, 29th pick, Nebraska. So it was the fifth pick of the third round. Who did she go to? She went to... Um, I don't know the WNBA logos. I'm sorry. I, don't, haven't you heard of the Caitlin Clark effect? Clark effect. We'll be watching this all the time now. Uh, oh, Matt, I'm down. <laughs> I can't tell who she went to. Um, yeah, I don't know where she went to. She went to somebody. <laughs> I mean, I hope somebody's yelling at their TV screen at home. Uh, well, let's see what else happened this last week. I don't, dude, I'm, still, I'm still coming off March Madness, man. Like, I'm just trying to chill right now. Yeah. Like, honestly, between the beginning of fall to like a week ago, it's, you know, it's just, it's sports, you know, football and basketball, what we cover mainly for the most part. So, like, by the time March Madness is done, I'm just a little fried. I want to go outside for a few months. Do you have kids involved in sports? Yeah, um, I have a son who's in baseball and a daughter that's in soccer right now, and I'm coaching both. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> Is it a joy? I enjoy it. It's just getting the schedules all to match up to make me do, to allow me to do both at, <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, no, I, I enjoy kids sports. It's, it's fun, at least my kids. Um, I've been able to coach them and. Those two, those two sports, basketball, football, and baseball on top of – yeah, I said baseball, sorry. Yeah. Now, I, I, coached, I coached soccer for 10 years. Nobody ever gave me crap about anything. Do you find baseball dads, do they get after you? Are they pain in the ass or 
can you answer that question? Should I have you blink you, you know, if you're in oh, trouble? Oh, no. Um, no, I really have any problems. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Everybody thanks me for doing it. So that means they don't have to do it. Right. All right. We're coming up on the end. One more thing happened that I can think of. Nebraska lost the series to Rutgers in baseball. And we have other people covering softball. So, uh, you know, tomorrow night, Andy and, and Miley do a softball show uh, here on YouTube. So, well, on YouTube and Twitter and everything. So be sure to watch that if you're interested in softball. Nebraska lost to Rutgers. Uh, they lot, they got walked off in, I think, the 11th inning Friday night. Then Saturday, they beat them 16-1. to 1. They beat the shit out of them. And then Sunday, they just, uh, I don't know, they couldn't pull it. They had a, like a 62 lead or 6-1 to one lead early on, and I just they just got shut down. Husker Chuck says Rutgers knocked this out of the top 25. You know, that's – I don't worry about the rankings. I, I The rankings in baseball really just – you know what they are? I think the rankings of baseball are a lot like what I talked about earlier, media bias and, you know, where the power structure is in a sport. And the power structure for college baseball is all in the South and the SEC. So uh, I, what I worry about is the RPI and finishing in the top two in the Big Ten. I think that's those are the two keys for me with the baseball team. And then beating the shit out of Iowa and Minnesota. You know, because uh, if, if we have to beat Iowa because they suck and they're horrible people. And then we have to beat Minnesota because uh, my rotten son that graduated from Minnesota doesn't give a damn about Minnesota baseball. But if they beat us, he has to remind me of it. There you go. So we need to be big. We need to beat Minnesota in every sport we play them in. Husker Chuck says hosting a regional matters a lot. It does. I don't disagree with that. Uh we play Creighton, I think, this week again, don't we? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to finish this off, are you watching anything on TV people should know about? Right now? No, it's it's actually kind of just a dead period for me all around when it comes to media. Not a whole lot of shows that I can think of. I haven't watched a show in a while. Um I'm trying to think of any movies or anything like that. Finally saw Oppenheimer a couple weeks ago. That was nice. I enjoyed that. Came away very positive. Full of hope. Um, re Rewatched uh, Ikuru, the Kurosawa film, the other day. That was nice. That's about all I got. Oh, my Sorry. God. Really? Yeah. Ikuru. Which one was that? That was about uh, that. He was like a civil. Uh, servant oh the park yeah. and he gets he cancer. Dies yeah. of cancer mm -hmm. okay that that is what 1955 somewhere in there somewhere in there yeah yeah it's good anybody hasn't seen it i recommend it yeah if you want to i akira karasawa films are always interesting they're always you know what mm -hmm. the guy that was one of the greatest filmmakers that ever lived so uh that aaron keen has got the fallout series on prime is pretty good Oh, you meant sports? No, actually, I didn't. I was going to say I started watching the Fallout series on Prime, and I enjoyed it because the Fallout series is a games for video games. It was probably my favorite set of video games ever. And the Fallout series, I mean, it, if you like the games, you probably like the Fallout series. If you just turn on and start watching the Fallout series, you're probably going, what in the God's name is going on? But, uh, you know, it's it's fun. It's silly. It's uh, – I. The, there's gore and violence because there's a lot of gore and violence in the game and it's silly gore and violence and the monsters are, you know, just off the charts because it comes from a video game. But I think it's, I think it's done well. Uh, Do you have to be into the video game to enjoy it? I don't know. Okay. Watch the episode. Do you get prime? I, I possibly, I think. <laughs> The only reason I ask is because one of my favorite actors, uh, Walton Goggins, is on it. Oh, he's he, his part is very good. Okay, so if I, I, I worth the I see think it, that I think they do a good job of, especially his character. You know, they set up his character. I think very very well. Nice. Okay. And and we're still discovering what happened. I'm only like three episodes in, and you're still discovering what happens to him or 
you know, I won't tell you anything, but uh, I, I think it's fun. The other thing I started watching recently was the three body problem on Netflix. And I, I like that because I'm a sci-fi guy. Did you read the books? I no. no I was just, I'm just curious. So you know. no, a lot of my book knowledge, you know, I, that, those memories are gone. Like I enjoyed the foundation series on Apple and I know that I've read the Foundation series by Asimov when I was very young, but I don't remember any of it. So, Speaking you know, they, they could do anything they want with a new TV series, and I'd be going, okay. You know, where Speaking a lot of, of times, like like yeah. Tolkien, if you mess with Tolkien, I think he should be shot myself, but, you know, because I remember those. There you go. Your- that's, our, that, that's, that's, uh, that's my end of show stuff. All right, we're done. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. Uh, Aaron Keen says three body problem is good. Tiger Shark Driver says John can't read. I, you know what? I can't read as fast as the comments go by. That's the problem. Is there are a lot of comments and they're you know I'm old and slow. And then Aaron Rostowski says the Bluey episode from yesterday oh, was great. I, I saw people commenting this on was Twitter. So, and I was oh, like, I watched that at six thirty in the morning with both my kids. I, yeah, we we watched it twice yesterday. It it it's emotional. It the make. Have you ever watched Bluey, John? All your kids are old, you know. But did you have you ever is watched it Bluey? Bluey the it's it, it's it a little dog. Yeah, a dog and his family. Um, but it's how they set up that show and how they set up a lot of shows. It's not just good writing and voice acting in it but it's also kind of the ambiance they put into it the music how they use the music it it it, it can pull out some emotions in you pretty quick depending on the episode and yesterday's definitely was one really yes yes they did a oh, very very good job where do people watch bluey uh disney plus and i think maybe <laughs> next, i think it might it or disney plus Whatever Disney channels out there, I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what you have? Nah. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Oscar Chuck says, show John some love. Hit that like button. If on your, if you're on YouTube, please do that because it helps us with the algorithm. And David Matney wants to know what happened in Bluey. I assume he's talking about Bluey. What happened? Yeah. It ends. It's very emotional, but it ends very nicely. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay. You're gonna okay. be good. Aaron Rostowski says tailgate. Uh, Aaron just published an article at Coronation about the tailgate we will be having on April 28th after the spring game. That uh, the day after the spring game in the Nebraska baseball tailgate. Are you gonna come to this? Um, I haven't checked my schedule yet. I know I have tickets to the spring game. I don't know if I'm going it's a yet. it's a Sunday for God's sakes. What else are you going to do, Coach? Golf. That's not don't. You can miss golf to come and meet people. I meet people all the time. <laughs> okay, I Why think do I that's have to drive two hours to meet people because yeah, I'll be there. And you can wreck my you can wreck my environment in person. That's what you can do. I'll see what I can do. Iowa, right? You, you it's in Nebraska. It's in Lincoln. Oh, I know, but we're playing Iowa. Yes, we are playing Iowa. <laughs> you, I, I, I'll tell you this. You can even bring a list of quotes from Ber, Inger Bergman movies or. <laughs> The seventh seal or whatever the hell it is. I just want one bad football game this fall so I can take over Twitter again. No, <laughs> there will be no bad football games this fall. Uh, David Whitney, David Manny says, can you give an abbreviated version of what happened? <laughs> no, David, I won't. <laughs> Okay, and when the Wilkins says, read my joke, John, you will get a good laugh. I will go back and look for it. Okay, that's it. We're done for tonight. Like I said, next week I'll have Mitch Sherman on uh, to talk about spring football. And we're gonna, after that, I hope to line up a series of interviews so Patrick doesn't have to come back. 
<laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Say good night, Patrick. Dan Falter lives. <laughs>